Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ignite the Night Tampa. My name is Max Briggs, and I'm the program executive for NASA iTech. At iTech, we try to open our minds and seek out solutions, people, and organizations that may not be primarily focused on NASA, but could help NASA's mission or NASA relevant commercial markets. That's why it's so great to collaborate with people like our friend Dr. Richard Manassi at Tampa Bay Wave and everyone at the Synapse Summit. We've had the privilege of working with Richard in previous NASA iTech events, and it has been a pleasure to continue the collaboration to bring you today's program. This is also our second year being included in the programming for the Synapse Summit, and it's great to be associated with such an enthusiastic and capable group of innovators focused on bringing about positive change. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of you for all the great work you're doing and for working with us the past few years. The Ignite the Night event we are bringing you today is a key part of the larger NASA iTech program, which aims to provide a low barrier to entry opportunity for collaboration and networking between entrepreneurs, investors, and NASA chief technologists. These events are designed to be rapid fire, allowing participants to establish many new con connections outside of their usual spheres in a short time. The winner of today's event will advance as a semifinalist in the 2021 Cycle One Forum, which will be broadcast on May 27th, and there's still time to become involved. If you are interested in participating, please visit www.nasaitech.org, where you will see an open solicitation for companies, as well as opportunities to engage as an investor, judge, or roundtable participant. Today's program features a talk from Jen Ustetic, the program director for NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate, uh, the early stage innovation portfolio, 10 three minute quick pitches from our roster of companies, including Morpheus Space, Fluid Technology Solutions, Space Products and Innovation, Dissolves, Spira, Physia, Mito Material Solutions, Quest Remote Sensing Analytics, Farad Power, and Full Cycle Bioplastics. And while our judges deliberate, deliberate, Chris Quilty, the founder of Quilty Analytics and a leading Wall Street analyst for the emerging space economy will deliver our keynote. But before we get started with today's pitches, I would like to use this opportunity to let the audience know a little bit more about NASA's evolving entrepreneurial engagement strategy, which I hope will keep NASA on the cutting edge of innovation for the foreseeable future. Across the federal government, many organizations, including NASA, are reconsidering their role in innovation and R&D. According to the National Science Foundation, federal and private investment in R&D were nearly equal until 1987. But since then, private sector R&D has quickly outpaced federal R&D spend. This trend is accelerating and will likely continue to do so for the foreseeable future. If we look at the most recent NSF data, we see that total private sector R&D spending was almost $550 billion of which about $140 billion came from venture capital investments. For comparison, NASA's spending on extramural R&D was about $5 billion per year. If we drill down even further to NASA's programs that focus on early stage innovation, such as the SBIR program, we see that NASA is a relatively small fish in the very, very large pond of innovation. Pessimists may see this as a problem, interpreting this as a sign that NASA is being outpaced unable to convince innovators to stop making apps and start building rockets. But I'm an optimist, and I think that, that threat is really an opportunity. I think that what this data says is that NASA no longer has to go it alone when it comes to innovating and operating in space. That there is a sophisticated and capable pool of innovators that NASA can now tap into to contribute to NASA's missions, as well as enhance capability and infrastructure in the emerging private space economy. To do this, we need to evolve beyond a government-only focus and figure out how to leverage the private sector effectively. And this isn't the first time this has happened. Consider the historical example of NACA, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. NACA was established in 1915 to turn crazy aeronautical ideas into usable technology. Usable at that time usually meant usable by the US government. In the early days of NACA, there was no real commercial aviation market serving passengers. However, fairly rapidly, the technology progressed and passenger air travel became not only viable, but profitable, and private companies began driving innovation in aviation. 
As this happened, NACA's role in the innovation ecosystem had to evolve. For those that don't know, NACA was absorbed by NASA when it was formed in 1958, and NACA's aeronautics legacy lives on to this day through NASA's aeronautics research mission director. ARMD now focuses primarily on stimulating emerging commercial aeronautics markets, such as advanced air mobility, unmanned aerial systems, and low boom supersonic passenger aircraft. The NACA transition from innovating to serve a direct government goal to innovating to stimulate emerging markets provides a useful analogy for the evolution of NASA's role in emerging space markets. Tasks that were once too risky and too expensive for anyone besides large governments can now be accomplished by private companies and sometimes at a fraction of the cost. Consider that only 10 years ago, NASA was flying shuttle missions to resupply the space station at a total program cost of about $1.6 billion per launch. Today, NASA purchases rides to the ISS from SpaceX at a cost of about $400 million per launch. This clearly has a direct benefit to NASA, but one could argue that the biggest impact of the new capability is making access to space more affordable for a host of commercial entities. As launch costs come down, more and more space-based business models become viable, making space an exciting host for several emerging commercial markets. If the United States wants to continue to lead in space, it is clear that we will not only need to lead challenging government projects, like getting astronauts back to the moon and onto Mars, we will also need to lead the commercialization of space. Just as most people in 1915 didn't comprehend how much commercial air travel would change the world in the coming decades, today, all except the most visionary among us probably have no idea how the emerging space economy will affect our futures. So the question for NASA is, where exactly do we fit in all of this? My personal hope is that NASA continues to be a mission-driven organization focused primarily on expanding human reach and knowledge of the universe by taking on the most challenging missions in the world, the solar system, and the universe, all while inspiring generations of thinkers and dreamers for decades to come. To accomplish these goals, we will likely always have a need to engage with traditional space companies that are highly focused on delivering high performance, high reliability products to low volume government customers like NASA. However, as space continues to evolve from a domain dominated by governments to a domain in which governments are just one of many customers, NASA must evolve and diversify too, stimulating and shaping these markets by engaging non-traditional space companies and leveraging private sector investment. In order to do this, we need to evolve programmatically. NASA must develop programs that are fast, agile, and human. We must figure out how to effectively complement and leverage private sector investment. ITEC's role is to shine a light on non-traditional space companies that either directly contribute to NASA-relevant commercial markets or have the opportunity to spin commercial technologies into a NASA application. For example, one ITEC alumnus, Momentus, who recently went public with a valuation of more than a billion dollars, is looking to offer space tug services primarily to commercial satellite companies. Although NASA is not the intended primary customer for Momentus, the advancement of space tug capabilities and competition among last mile delivery platforms could improve commercial capabilities in low earth orbit and make LEO more accessible for a host of customers, including NASA. Entrepreneurial engagement programs like iTech are a good first step to leveraging the power of private sector innovation providing a forum with many of the features that are expected in the entrepreneurial world, such as speed, flexibility, low barrier to entry, networking, and investor engagement. As we go forward, NASA will continue to examine its existing programs to determine how to make them more friendly for entrepreneurs and agile, growth-oriented, and commercially focused companies. Where we cannot accomplish these goals with our existing programs, we will continue to innovate new programs, to effectively leverage the private sector for the benefit of NASA missions and emerging space markets. Now that you know a little bit more about NASA's uh, evolving entrepreneurial engagement strategy and the challenges we face, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. I refer to her as the hardest working person at NASA, Jen Gustetic to talk to you a little bit more about how entrepreneurship fits into NASA's larger strategy for early stage innovation and beyond. Jen is an experienced advisor and leader in organizational transformation, technology innovation and entrepreneurship, and the future of work in the public sector 
as she has concentrated on research and development, open innovation, prizes and challenges, open government, uh, public-private partnerships, grants and contract management, and technology policy. Currently, she's the program, oh, it's a little dated, Jen. <laughs> it says, uh, she's, she used to be the program executive for the uh, SBIR program. She's now the program director for all of early stage innovations um, and, manage, uh, and manages $300 million per year in, uh, in uh, um, funding for innovative uh, startups, small businesses, and the like. Jen, thank you for coming. Thank you, Max. And um, <laughs> you definitely made me laugh with that, that comment of being the hardest working. I will say busy. We got a lot of hardworking people at NASA, that's for sure. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you all uh, today. Um, Max and uh, the iTech program and the Synapse Summit, thank you so much for your hard work to get to today. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to see the batch of companies that are going to be presenting in a little bit. Um, as Max said, uh, I am the uh, program director, the new program director, the first program director for the early stage innovations and partnerships portfolio for NASA. These programs just recently came together as a uh, portfolio last November. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, a few of those programs that have touch points to the entrepreneurship and investor uh, community, in addition to the, the work and the vision that Max shared around entrepreneurial engagement. And I just want to um, also give uh, Max a, a, a shout out for his, his work coordinating across the programs as we think ambitiously about entrepreneurial engagement for the future for NASA. So thank you, Max, and to the iTech team for all of that. Um, if we can go ahead and pull up the slides, uh, Robin, I, I just wanted to highlight for you guys a a few of the different programs outside of the um, space technology or outside of the iTech program that may be of interest um, uh, to the entrepreneurial um, as well as the investor communities. A um, uh, few of those that I will talk about today are the Space Tech Research Grants uh, program, uh, the SBIR program, technology transfer in ways that might be um, uh, a, a, a little novel, as well as prizes um, and challenges that uh, we use uh, pretty expansively at NASA. And many of these activities I would classify as technology de-risking activities that lead not only to infusions in NASA's missions, but also um, company growth and the uh, development of entirely new capabilities and markets. Uh, Robin, if you can go to the next slide. I wanna start with uh, one of the earlier stage programs uh, in the, the early stage innovation and partnership portfolio, the Space Tech Research Grants uh, program. This program engages the spectrum of academic researchers on early stage technologies uh, all across the country. And we've awarded almost 800 awards to date since the beginning of this program. We fund across the technology spectrum, whether it uh, be robotics and autonomous systems, science instruments and sensor systems, material structures, manufacturing, the list just goes on. Um, I really wanted to highlight this program to you all today because it really is developing innovative technologies at research institutions that could be the seed corn for the next great startup, but also um, that the talent being supported through these programs, through the educational components of these grants, um, really provide robust targets for recruitment and the next technical expertise uh, that are coming out of uh, universities working in these technology areas. These programs support not only innovative research uh, projects of graduate students, but also of faculty and encourage partnerships between universities and research institutions across the country and a number of institutes, for example, that we have that focus on high priority areas for NASA. Some of these research institutes will actually move on to attempt to commercialize some of these technologies in partnership with small businesses, whether they be small businesses that they spin out, the, the students or the faculty uh, spin out of their university, or whether it be um, an intentional partnerships with other small businesses to propose to programs like the SBIR program, uh, which is what is highlighted on the next slide. If you can um, move to the next slide, Robin. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, sometimes those research institutions will actually partner with small businesses to spin some of this technology out um, through other programs that provide other types and stages of funding. You all may be more familiar with SBIR. It's not an uncommon um, acronym uh, uh, out there from a variety of, of federal government agencies, but also from NASA. Um, but it's, it's a way that NASA uh, exclusively works with small businesses and sometimes, as I mentioned, small businesses in partnership with research institutions to de-risk technology that is of interest to NASA. 
Um, it's been in operation for 38 years. It's an incredibly reliable source of non-dilutive funding that is available every year coming out of NASA. Uh, this past year, for example, we awarded nearly $200 million in non-dilutive funding to small businesses and entrepreneurs related to the topics that are of interest to NASA. And even though the program technically falls in the Space Technology Mission Directorate, that's where the ESIP portfolio lives, SBIR actually advances technology priorities tied to everything NASA does, from human exploration to space technology to science to aeronautics. So it's a wide, wide variety of topical areas that can find alignment with SBIR funding opportunities. Now, we, we understand that um, in order to support NASA, who can be both a customer to these companies, um, but also um, a catalyst for some of these companies, that we kind of serve serve two distinct functions with the SBIR program. Um, in one way, SBIR operates as an R&D program. And the, on the other hand, SBIR can operate and can increasingly operate more like a seed fund. As an R&D program, we fund the maturation of technologies and really the de-risking of technologies for which NASA is the primary customer and help maintain the aerospace industrial base through those investments. In that way, you can look at these those contracts, those SBIR contracts, kind of more like revenue, an indication of NASA intending to be a customer of the technology that comes out of the back end of that work. But we also operate in some ways and in some parts of the program as a seed fund, where we invest in disruptive capabilities in emerging markets, increasing the company's uh, their, or the country's competitive advantage and generating opportunities for job creation across the country. The SBIR programs in the U.S. government really are something that is a um, a great uh, triumph in uh, government policy for the U.S. and that we have a devoted $3 billion annual fund for small business technology development and entrepreneurship in this country that most other countries don't, which is part of the generative seed corn for new ideas coming from small and nimble businesses in this country. Next slide, Robin. So we know that typically when you think of SBIRs, you think of uh, $125,000 phase one awards followed by a $750,000 phase two award. Um, but we know very much that phase one and phase two awards alone, though, you know, get close to a cool million dollars in undiluted um, uh, 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 funds is not enough to support by any means a company's journey to commercialization. So our program has created additional opportunities to help firms get there that participate in the SBIR program. And this is really part of the value proposition to even go through the effort to try to get in the pipeline at phase one. Um, we offer things like i training supplements, which put you through a lean launch pad uh, business model um, approach to customer discovery. It's an additional um, grant on top of your contract um, in order to get some of that training uh, around customer discovery and building that into the DNA of the business. Uh, we also have a really robust set of post phase two investment opportunities. So the investment doesn't just stop at that phase two $750,000 award. We have a number of other post phase two opportunities for people in our pipeline that can make awards up to uh, $6 million in value when you look at a CCRPP. That's a long acronym. I won't go into what it stands for, but a thing that the investors on the line might be interested in is that for programs like CCRPP and the phase two E program, NASA SBIR actually offers dollar for dollar matching um, to external um, or NASA program, other NASA program investors on those projects. And so we have seen uh, for CCRPP proposals, as well as for phase 2E proposals, that the matching investment has actually come from more traditional investors, as well as uh, folks uh, that, um, as, as well as larger aerospace companies, other government agencies, and other customers of the technology. But that's a thing to pay attention to um, if you're working with firms that are working through the SBIR pipeline and you're looking for some leverage on your investment dollar as well. Um, all right, next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit too about the technology transfer program. So I've spent most of the, the first you know, five minutes uh, talking about uh, funding that NASA provides to external researchers in order to stimulate uh, innovation and new ideas uh, in the country and the research enterprise for aerospace. But we also still do a ton of research, great advanced research at our centers with our own internal researchers. And um, that research that we do internally um, can result in the identification of new inventions 
uh, some of which we then patent and we work as an agency to license to the broader community in order to encourage commercialization and spin outs of those tech spin off uh, spin offs of those technologies. And this also covers a huge waterfront of technology areas, you can see um, on the screen uh, in front of me, the areas, the categories of the types of technologies that are being licensed each and every year that are resulting in uh, new companies and new uh, spin off technologies. Next slide. Uh, and I just want to highlight uh, a couple ways in which NASA is actually trying to increase the licensing of the great innovations that are coming out of NASA um, centers and facilities. Um, one is the startup NASA, NASA initiative. This one's pretty cool because it offers startup companies a license with no upfront costs for commercial use of our past patented technologies. Through this effort, we're letting companies hold on to their cash while securing the intellectual property that they need to carve out a competitive market space. Uh, and under this program, the Startup NASA program, nearly 99 new companies have formed leveraging NASA uh, licensed technologies since the program launched in October 2015 with 12 um, startup licenses so far negotiated this year. And you can see a few examples of some of those um, companies on this slide. Uh, next slide. Um, so I also wanted to just quickly touch on T2U, which is the uh, NASA Technology Transfer University program also, which seeks to connect NASA technology with student entrepreneurs at universities. So this reaches out to the, uh, the innovators when they're um, young, when they're still in their university experience and encourages students to get familiar with the NASA technology portfolio and technologies available for license as they consider business plans for new ventures. Currently, we have 24 active agreements with various universities across the country and are adding more agreements with various universities across the country um, as we seek to increase student access to uh, NASA technology. Uh, next slide. So I want to leave you with one final example. I know we've talked about research grants to universities, we've talked about contracts to small businesses, and we've talked about uh, technology licensing out of NASA. Um, but there's also one other mechanism that NASA has been using um, that I want to note today that we've been using for some time um, that is uh, really seeking to engage entrepreneurs and early stage innovators in uh, technology development and de-risking that's not really through a traditional government procurement process. Oftentimes, traditional grants and contracts require companies or researchers to submit proposals for evaluation, and then their work is funded through grants or contracts. But another way that NASA has been seeking to work with innovators around the country is through prize competitions, which um, are unique because the barriers to entry tend to be much lower for prize competitions, and winners are based on their actual performance not in all instances on proposals. It was actually under a prize competition authority that SMD, the science mission directorate, ran their entrepreneurs call last year, which some of you might also be familiar with. And so there are innovative ways to run um, competitions to engage startups through prize authorities um, that can reduce the barriers to entry um, as well for folks to, to work with um, NASA. There's tons of opportunities to engage with NASA through prize competitions. Um, and NASA Solve is the website where you can go to identify those opportunities. One very cool prize that just launched was the Deep Space Food Challenge that's looking to identify food system solutions and nutrition solutions for future uh, space travel. And there was just a, um, a, a very cool spot by Alton Brown uh, last week talking about um, space food and how we can deploy some of our um, ground-based solutions towards uh, uh, deep space objectives in the future. So lots of very cool uh, dual use uh, content that shows up in the prize portfolio. I'll just leave you with um, a couple examples. So um, in concert with the, if we go to the next slide, you'll you'll see here the Perseverance uh, rover, which just landed on February 18th. And um, on this Perseverance rover, there's actually eight distinct assemblies, subsystems, or components that had their initial research and development funding provided through the NASA SBIR program. And they are present and operating on the surface of Mars right now with NASA being a customer, a, a customer to flight of a number of these technologies that, that had their seed corn in the SBIR program. Um, next slide. Uh, but the SBIR program and traditional missions aren't necessarily the only way that uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs um, and innovative technologies will find their way into flight. Um, they're also finding their way uh, through other programs, some of which I, I mentioned earlier. So an example here would be uh, in the top left corner, you can see an image of 
a TechShot facility. Um, TechShot is the first US company to 3D print organic constructs on the International Space Station. In 2018, uh, they actually received one of those CCRPP rewards I was talking about uh, for a total project value of about $4 million, which enabled them to launch their facility to the ISS in 2019. And now uh, with that facility accessible um, on the ISS, federal institutional and commercial customers can contract with TechShot to use their services in orbit uh, uh, on board the ISS. Another great example from university research is um, what you see in the top right. Uh, that's a collaboration with the Stanford Autonomous Systems Lab and the Intelligent Robotics Group at NASA Ames that's seeking to use assistive free flyers which are small robots aboard uh, the International Space Station with gecko inspired gripper appendages in order to aid the astronauts. Um, and you see here a depiction of a four tile gecko gripper for an Astrobee free flyer facility that was launched on in 2019 and is awaiting demonstration on the ISS. And finally, in the bottom right hand corner, this is a great example of a prize competitions um, path to uh, 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 use at NASA. ICON is a company that's a construction technologies company. And they participated in a NASA challenge actually on 3D printing habitats on the surface of um, other planets. And participation in that challenge actually led them to a, uh, a project with um, a technology maturation program at NASA um, called the Moon to Mars Planetary Autonomous Construction Technologies or IMPACT project where they will be actually working with NASA to test soil simulant <coughs> with various processing and printing technologies. This company that had nothing to do with space um, that is now working on space, space problems through a prize competition and through the Game Changing Development Program. And I will leave you um, on the final slide to say, we recognize that uh, we play a role in a much broader ecosystem and that our funding on the SBIR program side, for example, can play an important uh, a, a role in de-risking technology, but a whole host of other people and investors and organizations play really critical roles in de-risking and accelerating the rest of a company's journey to growth. I just wanted to identify here on this slide, this is by no means comprehensive, but a few examples of companies that have been recently um, uh, recently experienced a merger or an acquisition or um, gotten on the SPAC uh, wagon that have their roots in technology de-risking um, investments from the SBIR program. So uh, uh, this is just a, a few of the companies that folks might not uh, be aware of or know that uh, have benefited from working on technology de-risking and some of these other uh, capabilities and services offered by um, NASA uh, funding and programs. Um, we invest in early stage research and innovative approaches to partnerships and technology transfer, not only with the goal to enable future missions, but to grow a strong and self-sustaining space economy. And there are many pathways to commercial success and many ways that innovators, entrepreneurs, and investors work with us. I want to congratulate the teams that are pitching today for Ignite the Night. Um, and I hope that many of you are able to make use of a number of these different pathways. Uh, thank you, Max, very much for your time. Thank you, Jen. That was great. Uh, I think it's really exciting to, to think not only about how the companies are engaging with NASA here today in, uh, in, through iTech, but also uh, how some of those uh, can transition through other uh, NASA programs, but also, uh, as you pointed out there, especially at the end, how they become part of the, the larger space ecosystem. That was really great stuff. And I'm looking forward to what NASA can do to, to continue to improve on uh, how it engages entrepreneurs and the the broader community community going forward. Thank you. Uh, before we go forward with the pitches, I do want to give all of our judges an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, iTech judges, uh, we, we recruit judges from many different backgrounds. Uh, not They're not just NASA judges. There's uh, judges from, uh, there's entrepreneurs, there's investors, uh, there's just members of the entrepreneurial community, uh, uh, along with NASA chief technologists, program managers, it's a great mix of people uh, and we all come together and try to make uh, better decisions, but also have more meaningful interactions with the companies uh, and with each other. So uh, we, we, we like the way that we diversify the judging portfolio here. And I'd like to give the judges a chance to, uh, to tell us a little bit more about themselves, starting with uh, Greg Clements. Good afternoon, everyone. So I have uh, 
had the privilege to work at NASA for 35 years in a variety of roles, currently serving the Office of Chief Technologist at NASA headquarters. Um, I have been my entire career a champion for leading change. I am very much attracted to thought-provoking and disruptive ideas to help keep NASA relevant and at the forefront at serving the needs of our country. We must continue to evolve. And there's a buzz that's among our nation's entrepreneurs that is a force for changing and continuing to transform our world. And it is very, very exciting to be able to uh, engage with some of the entrepreneurs and see what some of the ideas are. And thank you all for being here today. And I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> Rich Godwin, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hey, Mike, thank you. Yeah, Rich Godwin. I am. I represent Starbridge Venture Capital and Space Technology Holdings. Uh, Starbridge, I think, was the first exclusively space-focused venture capital company. I, I, I think we were. And uh, we're feisty and we're fast-growing. And then uh, Space Technology Holdings, we look at um, potential dual-use technologies that have come out of NASA or commercial space uh, efforts and programs to see if they can translate into commercial markets down here on terra firma. So very, very happy to amongst my good friends at NASA right once more. Thanks, Rich. Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Hughes. I'm the Center Chief Technologist for NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, home of the largest collection of scientists and engineers and technologists exploring the universe and trying to ex extend the reach of, of mankind. Of course, we've delivered the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, has been making observations for about 30 years, and we're about to deliver the James Webb Space Telescope for the next chapters in astrophysics, and we have a whole bevy of other missions that I'm not gonna go into. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Peter. Brian? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Kornfeld. I'm CEO and co-founder of Synapse, uh, the host of the Synapse Summit. Uh, I wish you all could be here in person uh, here in Tampa, but you know, we're thrilled to be able to still have this and host this great event as part of uh, our gathering of innovators from across the state of Florida uh, with thousands of people paying attention over this week. My background is actually in aerospace engineering myself. Uh, I spent a couple of years working with Northrop Grumman and helped pre-flight testing and launching of a satellite called STSS. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, it was a really fun program to be on back in the late 2000s. Um, part of what we do at Synapse is connecting innovators with opportunities. And this here is connecting innovators with an opportunity and finding those connections and those meaningful connections that can help propel you to the next stages of success. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the pitches and best of luck to all the participants today. Thanks, Brian. Coming to you from Cleveland, I can say that I certainly wish we could have come to you to Tampa as, as well, maybe, maybe in the future. Uh, Jose uh, Moray. Is Jose on? Hey, everybody. Yeah, I'm on. Sorry, uh, delay and, and log in. My name is Jose Moray. Uh, nice to meet everyone. I'm a physician by formal training. I'm an Eisenhower Fellow and CEO of Ad Astra Media. Um, my background is in emerging technology. Uh, I've worked as a associate chief health officer for IBM Watson, uh, and I've worked in various capacities as a consultant for uh, private equity firms, uh, both nationally and internationally, and as well as academic center and several government agencies. It's uh, a pleasure to meet everyone. Thanks, Jose. Uh, Richard, you're up. I'm going to assume you meant me. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Richard Benassi. It's great to see you. There's a couple of Richards here in the room. Uh, coming to you from Tampa, Florida, I wear a couple of different hats. I'm a serial entrepreneur, also an investor, and active mentor for a couple of programs throughout the country, including MIT's Solve program, as well as Mass Challenge, TMCX. And here in Tampa, I'm the director of the Tampa Bay Wave Tech Accelerator. I've been part of the team with Synapse for a number of years now as well, uh, and sit on the impact board, as well as oversee the health tech portion of the summit. Very glad to be here. Hope everyone is staying safe out there, uh, and certainly more than enough room for everyone to come and warm up down here in beautiful Tampa Bay. 
Thanks, Rich. Charles Norton. Uh, hello, I'm Charles Norton. I'm the Associate Chief Technologist of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm sure many of you enjoyed, as we very much did, the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars recently. But in addition to uh, missions and technology development in planetary science, of course, we do quite a bit of work in uh, Earth and atmospheric uh, science, astrophysics science as well. Uh, personally, uh, my background is in uh, computation on uh, high performance computers, in addition to a variety of areas tied to information systems and small satellite mission development. And I'm very pleased uh, to be with all of you here today. Thanks, Charles. Chris Romig. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Romig. I am the Technology Transfer Officer at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where we are home of America's astronauts and spearhead the human spaceflight program for NASA. Um, primary focuses are mission operations of programs like the International Space Station and the technology advancement work that we do in human health and performance, environmental control and life support systems, advanced robotic systems in support of astronaut um, activities and EVAs and also in situ resource utilization technologies. So making breathing air, drinking water, uh, drinkable water and propellant on the moon and Mars. Thanks, Chris. Mark Weiss. Hey everybody, good afternoon. My name is Mark Weiss. I'm the project manager for Deep Space Logistics as we go and explore the moon with our Artemis program. Coming from the Kennedy Space, space Center, our, our world's premier multi-user spaceport, where we launch, you know, to, to get all your great science up to space. Been with NASA for about 20 years, aerospace engineer, industrial engineer as well. And I've spent the last decade on the commercial services side. Jen mentioned, you know, leaning in and doing demonstration missions. Kennedy Space Center leads the commercial crew program, the launch services program. I helped set up the venture class launch services program. Also, Jen mentioned companies going to SPAC recently. So companies like Rocket Lab and Virgin Orbit came out of that type of program. So as we move forward with Artemis, build a platform around the moon with Gateway, we're hoping to set up a vibrant commercial supply chain in deep space, and we're looking for the competition and the help from all of you. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Mark. Is uh, Bruce Yost on? Uh, yes, Max, thanks. Um, sorry, my camera's not working. Uh, I'm Bruce Yost. I'm the director of the Small Spacecraft Systems Virtual Institute uh, for NASA. Um, the uh, institute works across uh, all of NASA um, and then academia and industry to advance the, the uh, utility and use of small spacecraft in support of NASA's tech development, exploration, and science missions. Um, I also uh, have quite a bit of experience working in the SBIR, SBIR and STTR programs, and there's a lot of synergy between uh, the two, as you would expect. And I'm glad to be here, and um, I, I, I thought Charles was going to, but I got to throw out a, a semi-good weather plug for California today, but I don't know if it's as good as Tampa, but I, I got to try. Thanks, Bruce. So I'd like to thank all of our judges. Uh, you know, we, we can't do what we do without having high quality, well-qualified judges who, who come at uh, problems for, from different angles. And, and this panel is definitely that. And, and your, your efforts here are appreciated, your involvement in the program, uh, even including the buy behind the scenes stuff, it's greatly appreciated. So thank you all. And uh, without further ado, uh, the reason we're all here is to hear from companies with exciting technologies. So, uh, uh, I believe uh, first up, we have Morpheus Space. Hello, my name is David Kalinske and I'm the Chief Revenue Officer with Morpheus Space. At Morpheus Space, we provide the world's smallest and most efficient satellite mobility systems. And in the next couple of weeks, we are going to release a pricing model that is gonna severely decrease the cost of entry into this revolutionary system by orders of magnitude. We address the following issues. Low Earth orbit satellite decay. We can extend satellite life by over 100%. We provide 12 times faster satellite spread into the proper orbit. We provide anti-collision and deorbiting capabilities. 
we make very low Earth orbit commercially feasible now. We can reduce overall satellite costs by over 30%, and we make autonomous operation of large constellations a reality now. We have two products, the NanoFeep and the MultiFeep. And you can see both of these products can fit in the size of your hand, in the palm of your hand. And again, with both of these products, the propellant that will last up to five years, and in some cases more than five years, is embedded within the unit itself that you're looking at. We are currently TRL level nine, and we are operational on two satellites with six of our thrusters. We provide thrust vectoring, and with these units, they are completely scalable. So you can put these on a satellite that is anywhere from one kilogram all the way up to a thousand kilograms plus by just adding more thrusters. We service both commercial and government customers, and we are currently targeting DOD customers. With that said, our request is that you help us get the word out. Our technology is revolutionary. And at this point, we are ready to go from within 90 days of a purchase contract to the satellite. We are available. Our initial investors are Airbus Ventures, InQtel, Lavrock Ventures, Palace Ventures, V Squared Ventures, and Techstars. Just to reiterate, we are completely modular and we are being used currently we have a patent pending, and again, TRL Level 9, affordable, the most affordable solution, the most efficient solution anywhere in the world.
Every physical product needs packaging, but not all packaging is equal. More convenient packaging makes products more valuable, which is how you take 10 cents of coffee grounds and make it into 50 cents of convenience. But everything has a cost. Once you're done using a product, it's plastic packaging ends up sitting in a landfill for the next 500 years. This fact has led to an unprecedented amount of consumer demand for more sustainable products, resulting in 94% of the United States' largest businesses taking sustainability pledges. My company Dissolves exists because we believe you can have conveniently packaged products that are still sustainable. We developed a patent-pending edible packaging that dissolves in water, and we use it to package individual servings of powdered food products like protein powder, tang, and instant coffee into convenient pots. With a pot, you just throw the whole thing in water and stir. Everything dissolves into the beverage, and our flavorless packaging has no impact on the end product. $400 billion are spent every year on food packaging of which 18 billion is spent in the United States on flexible packaging similar to dissolves. The way we make money is through the sale of our packaging as rolls to food and beverage companies. They use it to package their existing powder products as pods which can be sold for a premium. We've also developed a network of contract pod producers that allow us to partner with them to provide food and beverage companies everything they need to go from a loose powder to a store ready pod using our packaging. Dissolves capitalizes on the three fastest growing trends in food. First is health, which comes from our use of only natural vegan ingredients. The second is sustainability. All our ingredients are plant-based and our packaging leaves behind no waste after it's been used. And finally, portion, which comes from the single serving pods. These trends are equally important in space. Nutrition is a key aspect to extended manned missions. Reducing food co covered waste in space reduces the potential for hazardous bacteria to grow. Finally, portion makes food preparation easy. The reason why these are the three fastest growing trends in food, but we don't see more pods now, is because the only available alternative to dissolves is polyvinyl alcohol. This is the same plastic used in detergent pods. Our competitive edge is our natural vegan formula. It provides a clean label ingredient list, it's made with ingredients that are approved globally, and has a better compatibility profile. While working on dissolves, we've raised 50k in funding, which has funded the development of our patent pending packaging, the building out of our supply chain for the production of our packaging, and as well as building the partnerships with contract pod producers. We've also built out a funnel of over 100 interested companies, sent out 50 samples of our material, and right now we are working with seven brands to test the compatibility of our packaging with their products, and we had another brand sign a pilot agreement. Our team is made up of chemical engineers with experience making packaging out of edible polymers, and marketers who have experience in selling food products. We also have advisors with decades of experience in operating water-soluble film companies, as well as similarly experienced advisors in water-soluble pods. Well, thank you for listening. I'm Jared Rzewski. My company, Dissolves, makes convenient, sustainable packaging. Feel free to contact us about our upcoming pre-seed round. Satellites take years to produce and cost millions of dollars, sometimes billions. What if I told you this time could be cut by half, that the cost could be cut in half? Two of our co-founders, Ron and Saish, met in 2014 working on a satellite project. It took them three months to build the payload, but 12 months to integrate the satellite. And this didn't make sense to them. So they developed an idea of modular component integration. After researching the field, they knew they had a good idea and nobody had done it before. Hi. I'm Tal Azulay of Space Products and Innovation, SPIN, and we simplify space manufacturing. With more than 20 years of combined experience in the space industry, our team has developed an innovative product which takes a giant leap towards solving the problem of long spacecraft production times by enabling true modularity. And we do this with Magic. Magic is our patented hardware and software adapter, which connects components digitally without user intervention or driver installation. The adapter acts as a router that manages the connection between spacecraft components. Our vision is that spacecraft manufacturers should be able to put their systems together just like you'd build Legos, from CubeSats all the way up to large spacecraft. Satellites provide critical value, but they're vulnerable. 
Space is an unforgiving environment. Subsystems are unique. This leads to rigid design, high costs, and multi-year projects. More importantly, this is a barrier to innovation. The technology cycles in space are five to 10 years compared to just one to two years in the commercial electronics market. Magic enables modularity that can even allow in-orbit integration and reconfiguration. Imagine the flexibility this would allow in developing your next satellite. Imagine being able to upgrade an existing satellite with new technology and not even worry about integration issues. Magic is meant for the entire spacecraft industry. We're talking about hundreds and even thousands of satellites per year. Here you can see how Magic decentralizes the design of a satellite, allowing faster integration and a shorter innovation cycle. Using Spin's Magic adapter, you can connect satellite components just like connecting a mouse to your laptop. This creates an average cost savings of 40% and years in integration time, according to a year-long feasibility study. We've already sold to Airbus. Together with the German Space Agency, we plan to launch MAGIC to the ISS in 2022. Our existing partners already envision needs of up to 800 units for EU satellites, and discussions for another 100 units for commercial customers in the new space domain are already in advanced stages. NASA has declared that modularity is a critical future need, and SPIN has responded to an RFI representing MAGIC as a viable solution. We're targeting Lockheed Martin, NASA, Boeing, as well as smaller company partnerships and projects. Within five to ten years, the entire spacecraft industry will look different. People will take it for granted that components are modular. They'll be amazed when you tell them it wasn't always possible. The future will include magic, and we're happy you gave us this opportunity to share our dream with you. Imagine a rainbow oil slick on asphalt on a rainy day. That rainbow color represents the dyes used in cereals, candies, and other foods that you and your kids eat is made from petroleum. Dyes and products made from petroleum animals presents us with serious health and sustainability issues. Spiro grows algae to create sustainable and healthy industrial chemicals as a carbon negative replacement for petroleum products. Hi, I'm Surgeon Singh, and I'm excited to share with you what Spiro has been working towards. The demand for solutions to this problem within the food industry is so large that not even the pandemic could stop our growth. We've reached profitability in 2020 by selling primarily, primarily to U.S.-based beverage companies. Spears ingredients are now in products in over 700 retail locations around the country. And this is just the beginning. Spira is developing algae as a platform for the manufacturing of everything from plastics and clothes to medicines, you name it. But back to food, beyond colors. One of the biggest questions we as a team have encountered is how do we properly feed a future growing population? For Spira, they, the answer is simple, algae. We've developed technology that can help us grow our algal strands faster, better, and easier using the increased CO2 in the atmosphere as an advantage. Why should NASA take note? NASA astronauts are currently bringing all the food that they need to survive with them from the Earth. Their air purification processes are energy intensive and produce hazardous chemicals. Spears algae-based solutions for both CO2 removal and food production drastically reduce power consumption and launch mass for long-duration NASA missions. And we know Spira is the company to make that happen. One of the mistakes we've seen in the algae industry is overcomplicating the scaling process. Spira solves this by partnering with a network of trusted global contract farmers that specialize in growing and harvesting various algal species, allowing us to decrease our capex to nearly zero whenever we need to scale and allowing us to work with the farms to utilize our expertise in cultivation and genetic engineering to diversify potential species, develop new products, and maximize yields. Our lean but powerful team has experience in starting and growing companies, raising funding, working at major food companies, and we have a PhD in biological systems engineering with specific focus in algae. Spira is currently a post-revenue company and has been backed by both private investment and grants such as an NSF SBIR. We are currently raising a $2 million seed round with nearly almost half committed. We plan to use this funding to expand our sales efforts, to increase our revenue and invest heavily in R&D, to service the 70 plus LOIs we currently have, speed up our ability to bring products to market, and apply the CO2 capture optimization process to our supply chain to increase yields. 
Our next step is to expand our applications to confections, characterize the waste protein to a viable protein alternative, and scale our US-based ex uh, extraction operations. We are seeking customers, partners, and investors interested in the future of food and manufacturing on here, here on Earth and in space. If you're interested in chatting with the team, I invite you to please reach out to talk. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kevin Hi, Keith. Hi, I'm Kevin Keith, head of product at Mino Materials. A century ago, the most sturdy industrial materials were wood and metal. Today, the new standard is composite materials, a market currently worth $137 billion. The composites industry includes fiberglass, carbon fiber, and thermoplastic materials. The industry is growing because of the need to lightweight and push the limits without sacrificing performance. But composites have their limitations too, like the epoxy or glue that holds it together. The epoxy is incredibly brutal, affecting performance and part life integrity. In many industries, this prevents composites from being the go-to choice. At Mito Materials, we produce patented graphene modifiers with proprietary functionization technique that enhances these composites. The additive's unique chemistry makes it extremely versatile, allowing part manufacturers to create tougher, lighter, and more durable products. Compared to other leading technologies, Mito is able to deliver higher performance at lower loading levels, which makes us more accessible to cost-sensitive industries. For example, two pounds of material will make 2,000 pounds of polymer or 3,000 carbon fiber bike frames. Our products also integrate seamlessly with existing manufacturing processes. And we use that niche to target our customers. To date, our pipeline has a total opportunity of $124 million with customers spanning across transportation, marine, and recreation sectors. Our first piloting customer is one of the largest truck trailer manufacturers who is making the transition from steel panels to composites. Other additives didn't fit the bill, but with Mido, the goal of a lighter freight trailer that releases 50% less emissions is achievable. Our products are not only for use in transportation and sporting goods though, we can enable light weighting in any industry, from wind energy to aerospace and cryogenic storage tanks. And with this knowledge base, we're making products to enable composites like nobody has ever seen before. From a starch-based, bio-based additive to enable upcycling plastics that is in the process of scaling as we speak, to a simple to integrate additive that would turn composites into high energy storage devices for use in EVs, EV tolls and beyond, to drastically increase energy storage with no added weight. The team that we have assembled around Mino Materials is a balanced mix of technical and business talent with experience in chemical sales, manufacturing, and composite integration with industry experts who advise us regularly. Mino has two issued patents, three provisionals, and three products in development. We have great supporting partners, including Techstars, the National Science Foundation with two SBIRs, and a series seed investor that we close in September. We started Mido. We believe the advanced materials should not be accessible to advanced industries. We know in order to take humanity to entirely new heights, we need disruptive, versatile technology to push materials to the next sustainable frontier. Join us as we empower all industries to use the next generation of materials. Have you ever wondered about the next generation of medical devices and wearables? I can assure you that a shirt did not come to mind. 
At Physia, we are creating a comfortable, round the clock use, fully reusable, and washable smart shirt that mimics similar practical daily use garments that collects medical grade analytics and use proprietary sensors. AI. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Thornton, CEO and founder of Physia, and I'm here to share our exciting medical device smart shirt. The Physia smart shirt was created to focus on the healthcare market with emphasis on geriatric visuals with cardiovascular disease, others that suffer from early signs of heart disease, had a recent heart attack, require constant monitoring, bedridden, or engaged in cardiac rehabilitation. The value that our multi-sensor wearable device creates not only does it improve the outcome of patients with conditions that require constant monitoring, such as cardiovascular dysfunctions and respiratory illnesses, but also reduces hospital re readmissions, help alleviate the ongoing shortages of healthcare resources and staff. This also allows remote diagnostics to be more of a reality going forward, with the potential to be the next generation smart hospital gown. Other value elements are that our device creates long term usability. It allows the shirt to be worn up to 21 days thanks to silver and fabrics, and the ability to sustain over 50 wash cycles. Because of the form-fitting design of our device, it allows our software algorithms to better predict health data trends that is capable of detecting changes in patients' health and triggering alerts to healthcare professionals to predict acute pathological episodes and provide early warning of cardiac emergencies in patients chronic heart failure with high accuracy. Physio, we also understand that our device can create value markets and users outside of our target demographics, such as research institutes and professionals, first responders and military, and space explorations. This will also allow other industry researchers and clinicians the ability to collect our algorithm data to develop and validate the ability of Physio's predictive algorithm to accurately alert healthcare providers of clinically significant events that, signif that signals deterioration in a patient's condition. This concludes my presentation and thanks for tuning in. I have this distinct memory of being on the playground in first grade and my friend Ryan telling me about a man who was lost on the ocean and had to drink his own pee. What? what? Yes, I was horrified. So it's a bit ironic I would grow up and have a job that has me drinking my own pee. FTS is a membrane technology company. We make a membrane designed for use in forward osmosis applications. We're a pioneer in commercializing forward osmosis technology and have state-of-the-art membrane facilities. Reorganized in 2015, our core staff bring over 100 years of high technology experience. With a strong R&D and engineering base, we've developed global sales partnerships to commercialize our disrupted technologies in the water market. NASA played an important role in our history. In 2011, our pouches hitched a ride aboard the space shuttle STS-135 to prove that osmosis works in zero gravity. The aim was to use forward osmosis to reclaim wastewater, including urine, aboard the space station. With the U.S. Air Force, we are continuing this work and have been successful in recycling urine using simple osmosis. We've shown that this simple, passive technology, with no energy input, can recover a minimum of 70% of water from urine, making it a reliable, low-cost candidate for emergency water reclamation during space missions. 
Back on Earth, FTS has developed many and diverse markets for forward osmosis membranes for both industrial and personal hydration applications. In Saudi Arabia, for example, we're piloting a system that will concentrate RO reject brine from 78,000 TDS to 250,000 TDS. This is a large project requiring $60 million of FTS membrane in just the first year. Our industrial designs may have direct application to the current NASA water reclamation system aboard ISS, which is currently recovering about 70% of water from urine. We may be able to boost this to 85 or even 95% using our proprietary process and forward osmosis. Our personal hydration pouches have found many applications. My favorite project might be the simple pouches we've developed for disaster relief. 15 times lighter than water, highly reliable, and simple enough for children to use, the pouches speed delivery of relief supplies and save huge amounts of money in transportation costs. FTS has a strong IP portfolio, active demonstration projects, and sales opportunities of approximately $200 million. We are looking for additional investment capital to monetize our current sales opportunities and leverage future growth. The good news is you don't have to drink your pee to get involved in forward osmosis. If you are interested in these opportunities, reach out. We'll have a drink. What? You know what I mean. Imagine you're a farmer in California, managing thousands of acres to maximize your yield. Many factors must be considered at all times. Now imagine you can use an app on your smartphone and see how well your crops are growing, where they need water, fertilizer, pest control, and more. Your suppliers and buyers have the same data, so they are ready to meet your needs when you need it. That's just some of what Quest RSA will be able to provide via the first commercial CubeSat remote sensing system designed for individual end users and ag tech is just the first industry we intend to disrupt. Hi, I'm Lloyd French, founder and CEO of Quest RSA. We are a startup working with trusted partners to launch this unique system, targeting agriculture and agribusiness focused on end users to serve the needs of growers, suppliers, buyers, and shippers from plant growth through harvest. What is the Quest RSA difference? I'm Jim Golub, the co-founder, and I can tell you that this is a competitive space, but we have a technology platform that will exceed competitors. In targeting, we can see crops in one square meter across many spectral bands. In processing, we conduct very high speed onboard data processing calibrated for precision with uploaded ground sensor data. In visualization, we apply proprietary end user focused machine intelligence aided pattern analytics. And in communication, we are the first satellite service that communicates at high speed and frequency to the individual for immediate decision making. How ready are we? Quest RSA is at TRL6 with agreements in place with key partners, suppliers, and end users ready to demonstrate our pilot service. For our CUBE satellites, we have a strategic partnership with Harris Systems using their second generation 12U CubeSat, which we can configure. For our analytics and communications, we have partnerships with key proprietary technologies. And for our first customers, we have letters from firms and associations representing hundreds of growers agreeing to participate with our proof of concept. For NASA, how does Quest RSA solve space industry problems? First, our technology enables enhanced orbital platform pattern recognition using in-situ sensor data. Second, we provide lower cost with CubeSat architecture delivering affordable remote sensing services for customers on a large subscriber basis. And third, we're data processing efficient with pre-editing to reduce downlink data volume. Join us in delivering our customer specific high resolution remote sensing analytics service. We'll launch our CubeSat agile and adaptable platform with a focus on agriculture. 
we are raising capital for our demonstration phase, which will roll into commercial scale-up. Our vision is to expand over time to serve growing markets for end users such as forest fire prevention and detection, utility grid inspection, insurance risk assessment, and defense services, even consumer needs. Thank you, and we hope you'll join us on this mission. Good afternoon. My name is Shantanu Mitra. I'm the founder of Fabric Power, and along with my co-founder Vinod Nair and other strategic partners, we are developing an exciting new technology for lithium-ion battery materials. Our team includes world-renowned battery experts with more than 50 years of combined battery technology experience. The technology is relevant to some of NASA's applications like electrified aircraft propulsion and future outer planet missions. As you know, Demand for lithium-ion batteries is putting pressure on existing supply chains, highlighting the need for sustainably sourced materials. This is where Farad Power can make a difference. We have developed an advanced carbon platform technology that eliminates or significantly reduces the use of graphite, whose supply is dominated by Chinese companies. Our technical developments thus far have led to 10 granted patents. We also have an STTR grant from the US Air Force to develop cells for electric flight using this technology and have teamed up with Penn State University. The core of our technology is a method to manufacture electrode materials without graphite. We utilize renewable biomass-based raw materials like sugarcane waste and corn cob from which a liquid carbon precursor is extracted. We then process this in the presence of additives to make materials suitable for lithium ion battery electrodes. The critical requirements for batteries deployed in space include long cycle life, improved capacity and extreme temperature capability. Current lithium ion batteries have limited cycle life and cell capacity. Our electrode materials technology is designed to improve both these characteristics. For extreme temperature applications, the solution lies in improvements of the electrolyte. NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs has expertise in this area. We are in discussions with them to utilize their extreme temperature electrolytes with our electrode materials innovations to fabricate cells that will address all three critical performance characteristics. The addressable market for our lithium ion batteries is expected to be greater than 1 billion US dollars by mid decade, especially with the explosion in electric vehicles. To address this, we are establishing strategic partnerships with established manufacturers to help scale production. In summary, innovative materials from Farad Power for next generation batteries are the future of energy storage. As far as we know, there is no other company in the world using renewable resources to make carbon composites for battery applications like we are. Thank you. There is no more perfect system than a circular one, and no better attempt at closed-loop design than building for human habitation off Earth. Gateway, Artemis, and the enduring success of the ISS show the limitlessness of human potential and innovation in space, and highlight the importance of efficiency, reusability, and circularity in systems design. Amidst the excitement and opportunity of new space ventures, though, a less optimistic reality looms. Overproduction and waste, though inefficient, have become the global norm. 
Oil-based plastic pollution and organic waste generation and landfilling are huge drivers of climate change. But luckily today, we have a solution to both global crises with one new technology. My name is Delaine Mayer and I work with Full Cycle Bioplastics, a California-based biotech company whose patented IP turns organic waste into a non-toxic compostable plastic alternative called polyhydroxyalkanoate, or PHA. PHA-based plastic is fully customizable to its intended application, and it degrades harmlessly in a natural environment if not upcycled into virgin resin. Unlike other bioplastics, which rely on food source feedstock as a critical input, full cycle sources waste, which would otherwise be landfilled, thus reducing methane and carbon emissions. Because of our feedstock sourcing, our PHA is the lowest cost, lowest carbon alternative to oil-based plastics and has the potential for widespread adoption, disrupting the trillion dollar plastics market. Today, we work with some of the biggest food manufacturers to replace the plastic in their supply chains with food waste from their facilities. We're at TRL level eight, thanks to successful commercial demonstration at our tech partners facility in Mountain View, and we'll advance to TRL 9 by 2022 as we commission our first licensed facility in New Zealand and a commercial scale facility in California. One of the larger PHA producers in the market expects to be sold out of PHA through 2024, so we're scaling up to meet this global demand. We expect to close our Series A round by the end of this quarter, and investment and project finance opportunities are available to scale this technology up on Earth. Beyond Earth, PHA's tailorability to use specification and end-of-life target makes it a unique and valuable material in space. PHA has the potential to enable circular product development, such as PHA-based 3D printer filaments, PHA protective padding for sensitive equipment to survive launch, or replacing LLDPE food packaging with seed-laden PHA-based packaging that could be planted in a space garden after use. Our technology could even be designed to transform human refuse into a PHA-based material for radiation shielding or construction. In space, we're learning circularity is a requirement for surviving off Earth. We believe it's a requirement for surviving here too. And we're back. Uh, for everybody who's watching the live stream right now, uh, we had some technical difficulties on our end that prevented our judges from seeing the first video from Morpheus Space. We uh, uh, we are current, we would be scheduled for Q&A right now. Uh, I know that on the live stream, you guys actually did get to see that with no problems. So uh, uh, you are gonna get the pleasure of seeing that video a second time on the live stream so that our uh, judges can see it for the first time here and uh, ask uh, um, and uh, accumulate any questions that they wanna to ask to Morpheus. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Kalinsky and I'm the Chief Revenue Officer with Morpheus Space. At Morpheus Space, we provide the world's smallest and most efficient satellite mobility systems. And in the next couple of weeks, we are going to release a pricing model that is gonna severely decrease the cost of entry into this revolutionary system by orders of magnitude. We address the following issues. Low Earth orbit satellite decay, we can extend satellite life by over 100%. We provide 12 times faster satellite spread into the proper orbit. We provide anti-collision and deorbiting capabilities. We make very low Earth orbit commercially feasible now. We can reduce overall satellite costs by over 30%. And we make autonomous operation of large constellations a reality now. We have two products, the NanoFeep and the MultiFeep. 
and you can see both of these products can fit in the size of your hand, in the palm of your hand. And again, with both of these products, the propellant that will last up to five years, and in some cases more than five years, is embedded within the unit itself that you're looking at. We are currently TRL level nine, and we are operational on two satellites with six of our thrusters. I thrust vectoring, and with these units, they are completely scalable. So you can put these on a satellite that is anywhere from one kilogram all the way up to a thousand kilograms plus by just adding more thrusters. We service both commercial and government customers, and we are currently targeting DOD customers. With that said, our request is that you help us get the word out. Our technology is revolutionary. And at this point, we are ready to go from within 90 days of a purchase contract to the satellite. We are available. Our initial investors are Airbus Ventures, InQtel, Lavrock Ventures, Palace Ventures, V Squared Ventures, and Techstars. Just to reiterate, we are completely modular and we are being used currently. We have a patent pending. And again, TRL Level 9, affordable, the most affordable solution, the most efficient solution anywhere in the world. Thank you to all of the innovators uh, for putting together the, the presentations. It's now time to open up the Q&A session, starting with Peter Hughes. Peter, do you have any questions for the innovators? Yes, I do have a few. First with uh, Serge Singh for the carbon isolate and algal. I'm curious if there's any downside to your technology for us to be growing this in space um, and any risks, and if there's any negative byproduct for your for your biological process. Yeah, um, so really kind of answer that question. We're kind of, we're trying to push for being as circular as possible. So any sort of waste from the CO2 is meant to be converted into bicarbonate for the production of uh, algae that could be used for food. Uh, we're looking at different species that could be used for other things that could produce other, bi uh, you know, other byproducts, but we're looking at how those byproducts could be incorporated in any sort of system that is NASA related or even for like our earth-based operations uh, could be integrated to other industries. Okay, another quick question to Shantanu for Fired Power. How does your battery solution, your technology, differ than the performance of the current state of the art of other non reusable type uh, batteries? Yeah, so the uh, materials that I use today are basically graphite for the anode, which has a capacity, ca capacity max. And on the cathode side, also, the most of the materials I used are cobalt based, which is again uh, heavily concentrated in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the supply chains are extremely concentrated. The performance is also capped. So our materials are looking at uh, improved performance in terms of capacity and also a more democratic approach to the supply chain. Can you real quickly tell me what is the relative performance to the current state of the art? Uh, so we have, for example, on our graphite anodes, uh, we have measured about uh, 450 milliamp hours per gram in terms of capacity. Uh, the graphites today are about 360 to 370. That should give you a range of uh, performance. Right. Thank you. I'll let other judges offer our questions. Thanks, Peter. Uh, next is Richard Manasi. 
Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, Peter did ask some great questions that did overlap some of mine. I had a question for full cycle bioplastics. You had mentioned that you're tier, at TRL 8. Um, can you walk me through the commercialization steps for the next 18 to 24 months? Sure. I'll actually turn that question over to Dane Anderson, who is our co-founder and co-CEO. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, yeah, so we're we're actively scaling up. We have a, a tiered scale into commercialization in our New Zealand facility, which is under design now. That first tier is a 10x scale up, uh, and it's testing out uh, a few modules at that size, and then we're we're scaling into additional uh, scale up modules and accepting new feedstocks in those um, in that facility. So we're we're essentially bringing in additional um, more concentrated carbon rich feedstocks that will enable us to expand that facility and scale up the individual modules to a larger scale. And then in our California scale up path, we're testing additional feedstock front end sort of upstream systems there um, and starting at a smaller module there as well. So we, we're actively engineering those scale up facilities now and have signed the, the license for the New Zealand, New Zealand facility. And from a revenue standpoint, so you will be revenue generating in 2021, 2021? Um, I mean, we are, we are revenue generating through the through the license that we signed. Yes, but um, we don't expect that facility to produce material uh, in a commission state until probably mid 2022. And that will be the, the recurring revenue off of the plastic production. Excellent. Thank you very much for Physia. Next question. Uh, Physia, with regards to your technology, how would that compare against uh, some of the things that are happening in the market right now with regards to Apple Watch and other commercialized products? Okay, um, excellent question. So what we're doing is um, all of our sensors and our shirts are printed. So we're creating more data points with uh, our secret sauce being our software. See with our software alg algorithm is able to predict trends that wears uh, and wears that's wearing our garment to, ident to identify things such as irregular irregularities in the heart, uh, any type of uh, chronic conditions such as uh, fatigue, or anything that may occur. Whereas an Apple Watch is more an event based. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Last question for Dissolves. Uh, Dissolves, where are you at in your commercialization pathway as well? Yeah, so we've scaled up the production of the material. We can make rolls of that now. And now we are working with contract potters to ensure we could uh, produce pods efficiently on their full scale process. So we've done bench scale with them successfully, but now we're getting onto that next level. Excellent, thank you very much. That was the last question for you. Thank you so much, Richard. Greg Clements, you're up next. Hello, oh, sorry, it took a second to get going. So I might as well uh, continue the questions with uh, Jared and Dissolves. I was wondering if there is a temperature range or a type of fluid that uh, you're restricted with what's able to dissolve. It has to be boiling water or can I dissolve some vitamins in an ice cold beer? I was just trying to figure that out. Yeah, so that's a big part of our technology. Uh, the solubility of it, we made it so it's soluble in hot and cold water. Uh, and the types of polymers we use. So it's an alginate based packaging. So before there was uh, calcium problems. So anything with too much calcium would stop it. But then a part of our technology is actually sequestering that calcium and allowing it to be dissolved and stuff like milk and nut milks. And there's no temperature dependence as uh, or like melting and such. Just the ability of the dry packaging. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. I had a, let's see. I had a question for Nathan in Fluid Technology Solutions. Um, something that has really tripped us up uh, up in space is are the brines and salts that are in our urine that we're trying to to uh, um, purify. And you know, no membrane is perfect. And I was wondering what kind of um, um, you know uh, challenges or have you been able to overcome that issue? I think that you're talking maybe about the precipitations that you're getting, or are you talking about yep. the difficulty of filtering? Yeah. So um, we, this Air Force project that we're working on right now, we've shown that 72% uh, recovery of water from the urine, but that's just with an unmodified device. Um, so uh, in terms of the salts, uh, you know, with osmosis, it's not like a reverse osmosis. You don't see the same pattern problems. Okay. 
All right, and then I had uh, one other question, and it's for Delane um, and full cycle bioplastics. I was, you know, I, you had briefly mentioned that you know you could potentially take some of the uh, packaging and eventually use it to to maybe uh, be used for plants or a seed bed to grow. Uh, um, something on space. How easy would it be to convert the packaging you've created back into other products or other uses? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's ideally how our PHA ends up is we are upcycling it in a full cycle facility. So obviously if we're doing that in space, we have another question about how we do anaerobic digestion on the ISS or on a lunar station, but on earth, that is the intended end of life application. It's very interesting. Th those are all my questions, and I thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, Bruce Yost, do you have any questions? Yes, I have a couple. Thank you. Um, first, for Talat Spin, um, I, I just for the plug and play architecture, um, is the for the uh, how do I say this for the payload providers or the customer providers. Is there a specific um, uh, interface or bus uh, architecture that they have to adapt to to be compatible with you, or or do you extend that all the way out to the uh, to the to the customers' components? If you follow my drift. Hi, thank you for the question. Um, yes, well, that's the whole point is that we're uh, we're accommodating them. Uh, we cover so far a, a number of uh, standard protocols and drivers. Um, I would turn to my colleague, Saish, who could specify if uh, necessary. Yeah. Uh, hi, my, my name is Saish. I'm working with Tal in the uh, Bitspin. Uh, at this point, uh, we work with all commonly used space protocols like Spaceware, CAN, UR, Discord, Siemens, Bus. And therefore, we are, have, we, are, we are not going towards a more standardized product, but making it more universal. So, okay, thank you. And uh, another question I have is for Lloyd at Quest uh, uh, QRA. Uh, uh, Lloyd, is the, are, what's the revisit time? How many spacecraft are you proposing? Or, or maybe what's the better question is, what's the latency from when a uh, customer makes a request until the, the data shows up on his, uh, on his laptop or his handheld? Hi, Bruce. Uh, that's a very good question. So we're looking at um, starting off with a singular satellite uh, as a starting point. So you have the two days um, over a particular uh, target area or crop area. And we're looking at uh, a latency uh, in the order of uh, an hour from data uh, gathering and uh, processing down through the ground station to uh, an end user uh, based on what their need is. Okay, thanks. That's all the questions I had for now. Thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, next, if we can, uh, Brian Cornfield, Feld, if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, the, sticking actually with Quest, um, I heard a lot about the ag tech. What other industries is that uh, capable uh, to do any measurement with from outer space and that rapidly? Uh, we're looking at a number of different potential uh, markets to uh, leverage the uh, um, platform asset in terms of visible related um, detection capabilities, such as in uh, fire prevention and in um, oceanics, in terms of uh, evaluating the field in terms of a number of different variables to understand either dryness related concerns or looking at um, algae related or algae blooms. I can refer a little bit of this to um, uh, to Jim, Jim Golub, uh, to uh, also fill in. Oh, I think Jim is still muted, Jim. So we have we have targeted initially agriculture, and we've worked with hundreds of growers who are really excited about being test cases. They're actually lining up, uh, but we've also focused, as as Lloyd mentioned, with forest fire, where we have some distinctive synergistic capabilities. We also are targeting distributed infrastructure inspection, where we've been working very limitedly at this point with utilities. But what's fascinating, and Lloyd is the expert here, is that the, the combination of very high resolution, like one square meter, plus the multiple spectrum analytic with the algorithms to detect specific solutions, we can actually deliver cross-cutting capabilities. So we can serve different markets that leverage the platform laterally into serving you know, each one. 
And by the way, eventually we'll do it for consumers. We really actually can make it for individuals, but we're not there yet. We're starting with precision ag, forced and distributed uh, infrastructure like power and utilities. Uh, I'll, I'll look forward to that being available. Um, and then for uh, fluid technologies, how do you set yourself apart from others in this space? Not that I've researched this space in particular, but I can't imagine that you're the first to do something like this. So what's the differentiator? Actually, I think we were the first to do something like yeah. this. Uh, I think we were the first, uh, first to commercialize for osmosis products uh, in our pouch products. And we've done a lot of innovation in the space. I, I assume you're talking about the forward osmosis space as opposed to, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. No more questions. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, Chris Romig, do you have any questions? I do. Thank you, Robin. Great job, everyone. Appreciate the presentations and hard work that went into it. My first question is for a full cycle. Uh, we talked about commercial scaling up. I'm thinking the other direction. So how well does your technology and methodology scale to local residential or from a NASA perspective, a lunar habitat with four to six astronauts for six months to a year? <laughs> That's a very unique question. Um, I would say, you know, Commercially, it might not be viable for us to pursue something at that scale. However, we're happy to work with NASA in any capacity. So if you want to talk offline, I mean, I think I would imagine it really comes down to the amount of feedstock that we're able to run through our system. And maybe, Dane, you have a better answer on what the minimum tonnage would be needed to set up a small facility. Well, the economies of scale on four to six people are not great. Chris, but that's okay. Um, typically, we think uh, a profitable, investable facility looks mm -hmm. like uh, able to serve about 40,000 to 50,000 people. So areas that small, which um, is not that much organic waste. I mean, we can take in sort of uh, 150 to 200 tons a day and, and have that facility be standalone profitable with no subsidy whatsoever. Um, so it allows us to distribute very small in terms of plastics production facilities. But in terms of individual household items, um, we haven't quite gotten the economics uh, to function there. But, you know, I guess it depends on your your appetite for expensive biopolymers in space. <laughs> oh, perfect. I appreciate that. I, I look forward to the day where we have 40 or 50,000 people on the moon. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what comes of it. Uh, next question is for in um i'm curious what other markets or end uses have you found for magic i'm thinking terrestrial applications well we we're focused on space right now because our product is basically space hardened i mean the the components are are um have a space legacy so uh, we're, we're focused on that I, in internal discussions obviously the the concept of uh, modularity and plug and playability um for the computer you know the existing terrestrial electronic market is you know i mean you can already plug and play your mouse and uh, mm -hmm. uh things like that are already advancing towards um uh, aviation um so it, it's kind of like the it seems like the higher up you go in altitude the farther back uh you know that has progressed um so we're focused on space right now okay. i think we, we did we uh, one, i mean there's it's a shame that the project went down but there was the um was it the one web the balloons uh you know mm -hmm. you know so obviously if you have like you know very high altitude balloons they're exposed to the kind of radiation long term so that could be relevant going forward great thank you and last question for dissolves uh you mentioned the applicability of your material at both hot and cold temperatures are there any concerns with your packaging breaking down prematurely in high humidity environments uh it can be a concern depending on the product you're packaging. So depending on how hydroscopic it is, uh, mm -hmm. more water will come into it. You probably won't get enough water onto it from just the atmosphere to have it dissolve. Uh, if it's a particularly hydroscopic product, we could put starch on it during the production to stop any sticking as well. So it's a concern, but or not a concern, but a, something that we look at on the upfront to make sure it doesn't happen on the back end. Cool, great, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Great, thank you so much. Next up is Rich Godwin. Thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, first question is for Lloyd at Quest RSA. Um, 
I wasn't quite sure about you, but your business model is exactly right. You're actually going to be manufacturing the satellites, putting your own satellites on orbit as opposed to data aggregation. Um, at what point, if you do that, are you revenue positive? Is it one satellite or do you need more in order to be able to get to a uh, revenue scale? I think uh, satellite capabilities moving forward that our partners, given uh, the instrumentation that they're currently working with, which is in the visible and near IR uh, related spectrums in terms of its applicability to AgSat. And from that vantage point, uh, we would add in additional uh, satellites. So we can start um, uh, being able to apply uh, our capability with the singular up platform uh, results in the second and third um, uh, generations by adding the additional uh, platforms. Um, Jim, uh, did you want to add uh, to that? Am I mute? Am I off? Very good. Here you now. So L L Lloyd represented ourselves as starting with a, a satellite, which we do not we do not build a satellite. We configure it. We have it's a beautiful satellite with incredible capabilities that we are applying to civilian markets for the first time. Nobody has this high resolution, no one has these capabilities. We don't expect to make revenue from the beginning, although we have lots of farmers ready to test it out. But we're also testing in these other markets and we're gonna have a market, two different models. One model is a, a subscriber model with a price that's highly competitive with what you could buy from a drone or an on the ground analyst. But we also have clients who will be paying for fee because there is no prior product. In forestry, in utility, there aren't actual products that are analogous to this. So those will be fee-based services as opposed to subscriber-based services. So we're going to find out. We're going to be very narrowly focused to begin with. We're going to start with the agriculture or the forestry people because we have two different dialogues going, but the forestry people are standing in line next to the ags. We'll have different models for each market. Uh, well, you have, I mean, how many different frequencies are you uh, working in the hyperspectral area? Uh, that's for Lloyd to talk about. We have, we have eight, we have eight spectra, but we're going to be adding to those in else using nano, uh, what do you call a uh, uh, hyperspectra? Go ahead, yeah. Lloyd, talk, say something about that. You, you're mute. You're yeah. Mute. You're mute, Lloyd. Uh, sorry about that, Richard. I think you were talking about. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, right now we're looking at a um, detector that works in eight bands. Um, we will be able to uh, be able to develop data sets with regard to NDDI and uh, excessive green to be able to do uh, plant-based uh, health evaluation, as well as canopy and um, volumetric growth with regard to uh, the target uh, crop in, in question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Rich. Uh, Rich, I'm sorry, you're out of time. Right. Okay. All right. Yes. Next up is Mark Weiss. Do you have any questions? Yeah, so I'm going to follow up to Chris and go back to the full cycle with the lane. So talking about downscaling, if we're in a confined environment going out to the moon, how much can you automate this process? Is there is there hazardous byproducts that you can control if you had it in a smaller package? That's a good question. I don't believe that there are any hazardous byproducts as a process as a part of the process. Um, I'll turn that over to Dane just to confirm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, there are no hazardous byproducts. I mean, we, we we sort of stockpile the organic waste breakdown products into water solubles and don't let them come off as flammable gases. So there's no combustion risk. Um, and even in the extraction process, we're able to use bioprocesses to purify the polymer. Um, so it's it's a benign process. You think there's a way to get to automating it, or does it have to be very hands-on when you do it here in the, in the large scale? Um, I, I think as we develop more automation on the analytics to ensure quality, uh, then, then yes. But right now, there are still offline analyzers that require technicians and whatnot uh, to push forward, but we are developing those currently. So I, I think, yes, we will, we, will, we will be able to get it to automate it. And maybe flip into the product side, when you've extracted the, the feedstock coming in. Can we use that feedstock for a, on a manufacturing environment? Have you looked at 
if we use something like your product in a packing situation, any testing on that extracted material for how it handles and pressure and vacuum type environments? You know, we have not pursued the processing in vacuum environments yet, but we would be open to. Thank you. Quest for Jim and Lloyd quickly. You mentioned getting data within an hour. Any ground station strategy that you have so far? We're looking at a lot of onboard processing as part of the, um, our data chain process to be able to reduce the amount of uh, information and thus be able to reduce it down to the essentials of what an end user would want, thus simplifying the uh, data chain and uh, be able to send the data back. Um, we're looking at working with our um, uh, collaborators in terms of the growers, in terms of their needs and be able to uh, data uh, that's required in their data product. Uh, Jim, did you have anything you want to add to that? We have the we have the privilege of actually testing a very proprietary new mode of communication that is a breakthrough in encoding and decoding data that will also enable the more sufficient a more efficient communication directly with individuals. So it's not requisite; it's part of our package, but it really is a very high IP focused differentiation of what we're offering. It really changes the nature of communication from the individual in space uh, from the spacecraft to the individual on the ground. Okay. Thank you, Robin, nothing else. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jose, you're up next. Hey, um, first question uh, that I have is for Alex. Alex, you mentioned that your, what kind of make you, your guys stand out from other kind of wearable technology um, is your, your software and your data. Uh, can you go a little bit more into that data? What data are you currently using to do your model and your training? And, um, from previous and then how big is the data going forward and where, how are you acquiring it? Okay. Awesome. So right now, uh, we've been conducting clinical trials with the university locally and a hospital. So we've been, uh, trying to refine our algorithm to be able to, uh, weave out outer fact noise because all our data is meant to be uh, hospital grade clinical data. So we've been testing it with two patients that actually have a known heart disease. So we've been comparing it with current devices such as the bio patch to create validation to see how our data compares to theirs. And so far we've been doing really well as far as the heart rhythm goes, but the algorithm still needs some work because we've been uh, using some of that data to submit to cardiologists that we have as, as advisors working at Stony Brook uh, Hospital. And they've been dissecting the data for us to actually figure out is it comparable to comparable to what they could currently use as cardiologists. So that's been pretty good so far. We actually next week we're actually sending this shirt over to them to actually use with some of their patients. Gotcha. Uh, and the patches are are printed and then put into the shirt, or is it actually a smart fabric that's woven? So no, the smart fabric is fabric is something we're actually experimenting with. The uh, patches is something we send off to an outsourcer and they print it in the place that we wanted to. It's patent pending. We actually print uh, up to 18 leads in the shirt. That way it, it monitors uh, thoracic respiration, abdominal respiration, uh, pulmonary impedance, muscle activity, and heart rate. And we're able to do all of that right now. Copy. Thank you very much. Um, and then I have a question for Delane uh, and Dane for you guys. Um, either one can can take it. it the the recycling te technology and the kind of full cycle concept uh, is very popular, very hot right now. There's a huge number of players within the space. How are you guys? How do you differentiate yourselves? So how do you make you make yourself come up above the fray? Because there's a lot of people trying to do what you're doing right now. Yeah, so one of the biggest differentiators is that we can take a mixed feedstock. So we are taking compost from, you know, a municipal facility. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be pure. And we can take a that mixed feedstock and turn it into a homogenous VFA volatile fatty acid intermediate. So that's one of the main differentiators. We're not, again, similar to what I said in the pitch, we're not using that food source feedstock, which has its own set of environmental and economic challenges behind that. 
And additionally, our PHA resin is made with wild and non-GMO bacteria. So our process is inherently more biodegradable because of those inputs. And Dane, feel free to chime in if I missed anything. Yeah, sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, I think th there are there are a bunch of players in the space for PHA, but there are diff different pathways and approaches. I think some of the other pathways that you may have seen are from methane. I believe make materials, new light technologies. They uh, they also pursue that. They both pursue methane based pathways or gas based pathways. Um, we're able to essentially take that organic waste and not break it all the way down and not lose conversions um, on doing that, which also gives us uh, more carbon access um, from the, the substrate. And we were able to build back up from those higher chain molecules uh, or higher carbon number molecules into the, the PHBV that we make. And beyond that, the PHBV is a tailorable co-monomer. It's, um, it's much more, and there's many more options to replace polypropylene, polystyrene, and polyethylene. Uh, depending on that co-monomer composition. And because we go from those volatile acids, we have access to any of those co-monomer compositions uh, without paying for expensive precursors. Um, All right. And Jose, you're out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, next judge, Charles Norton, do you have any questions? Oh, thanks. Yes, I do know we're a little behind, so I'll be brief, but I do want to thank all the presenters for their interesting presentations. Uh, very enlightening. Let me see, my first question is for uh, SPIN regarding your plug and play architecture. I couldn't discern, uh, number one, whether or not it's a wireless capability and do you support power and comm or other types of services to reduce harnessing? Could you comment on that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, it's not wireless. Uh, it has uh, physical ports uh, for connecting the, the subsystems. And yes, we support uh, all, all manner of uh, subsystems, comms, power, um, uh, telemetry, uh, and, and also any sensors. That's the whole point. Uh, um, anything that you want to add? I mean, so could you comment on how it really varies from any type of standard uh, backplane bus that you would typically have on a flight system? Is it just smaller or? or? No, uh, actually, I think that I would ask my colleague uh, Sage to to respond to how it compares to a to other bus. Sage. Oh, I'm sorry, man. We can't oh. hear you. I believe they dropped or they have low bandwidth. Okay. Well, that's okay. But I did get the general point. Yeah, well, I, well I, I, can, I can say that what our, what our product does is it automatically recognizes the, basically the output of the, the subsystem and allows it to interface uh, seamlessly with the, with the main uh, computer. Uh, so what this is allowing is, first of all, in the integrations uh, cycle, to just be quicker. You don't have to actually have to, you know, like like back in the day, you wanted to add a modem to your computer, you had to install the drivers. Uh, uh, and it really is uh, a matter of minutes instead of uh, days or weeks. Okay, very good. Yeah, I'm sure you have a number of safe to mate processes and checks in there for uh, protection. Um, if I have time, perhaps I could squeeze in one or two more questions. Uh, just a quick question for Quest. Um, many of the questions I had were brought up. Uh, could you just say something about what the ground resolution is that you're looking at with your system? Oh, hi, Charles. Good Our question. Meters. Hey, hi, how are you? <laughs> um, we're anticipating um, roughly one meter um, resolution on the ground uh, per the optics that we uh, have on board. Okay. So it sounds like it's not on a CubeSat. You probably have a mini satellite bus. It's a new CubeSat bus. Um, the, uh, as you know, it's sort of a prismatic sort of construct where we maximize the um, uh, telescope so the, 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 the mirror is basically square. Right, okay, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, very good. Yeah, thanks very much, Lloyd. And then uh, finally for, uh, for full cycle bioplastics, I'm just curious about um, if you've done any testing 
of your product material um, across extreme environments and uh, you know temperature changes? Do you know anything about how its performance is based on um, the raw materials you're using to produce the plastics? Thanks for the question. I'll turn that one over to Dane as well. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, extreme is a relative term, I guess. Um, most of the ferment, you know, it's a fermentation drive process. So we need to be at reasonable mesophilic temperatures to generate the polymer. But the polymer, once it's produced and how it behaves in various temperatures, um, bioplastics for the most part have lower melting points. So I wouldn't shield the outside of a spacecraft with it. Um, uh, it's behaved well in my stomach. I ate some and it went fine for me. Uh, but it does not have a great mouthfeel. It's very plasticky. Um, we, we've, that's a long way to say we've not done too extreme temperature testing on the polymers itself. Um, it has a TG around zero uh, for glass transition temperature. So um, you may start to see some changes as it gets to very low temperatures. Oh, very good. Thank you. And maybe I could squeeze one last one in since I am the last uh, questioner. Uh, for Morpheus, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, you did mention your uh, propulsion systems are at TRL-9, they've flown. Um, can you say anything about uh, what level of uh, long life testing and uh, contamination analysis has been performed? Uh, thanks for the question, Charles. Uh, as far as long life testing and con contamination, I would have to defer uh, that discussion to something a bit more uh, private, given the public nature of this, um, if you wouldn't mind. That's and, fine. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, we have done the testing, and, and I would love to uh, speak offline about that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and thank you, Charles. Uh, that concludes all of our judges' questions. I'm going to turn it over to Max. He may have one other. Yes, I wanted to uh, ask a question of Mito. Um, you guys have, uh, you know, uh, uh, composite materials have a ton of applications, and uh, you cited uh, several of them, uh, including energy storage for uh, EVs, which is which is NASA relevant for AR and D, but um, I was curious to know how you focus yourselves. What do you consider to be your primary market focus and how um, and, and, and what's the size of that market? Like, what are you going after as your number one? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's not that we're going after a specific market application, because as soon as we do that, we section ourselves off. So what we've done is we've focused on key material properties that largely affect composites. So it's flexural, tensile, and compression properties. And then it bleeds into other market applications to where we've seen a lot of interest from transportation, sporting goods, and even wind energy that we're going into. Now, mind you, this is across both thermosets, so like epoxies and ester type resins, and thermoplastics, so like polycarbonate, uh, nylon systems, and even some uh, uh, PEI systems that we're going for. So uh, those are our target three markets that we're looking at, and overall, that's uh, last I checked, it was about two hundred million dollar opportunity for us. Thank you. So that concludes the Q and A portion. Uh, Richard Manassi, if you would like to uh, intro our keynote speaker, we can begin our uh, judges' deliberations, and uh, and hopefully the live stream audience uh, gets a lot out of the uh, of Chris Quilty. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure that I get to announce today's keynote speaker for the NASA iTech Ignite the Night Tampa event for here for 2021 Synapse. Uh, it is Chris Quilty. Chris Quilty is the founder and a partner of Quilty Analytics. Prior to establishing Quilty Analytics in 2016, Chris served as a cell side research analyst with Raymond James for 20 years, publishing hundreds of company specific macro, sector, and thematic research reports on the industrial, defense, space, wireless, and communications industries. Chris is widely acknowledged as a thought leader in satellite and space ecosystems. Chris has received a BS degree in systems engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1989 and also holds an MBA from the University of Chicago, which he received in 1994. Thank you very much, Chris, for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you. And uh, I'll do a quick mic check. Am I sounding good? Thumbs up. Okay, I got a thumbs up.
You never know. Um, great. So th thanks for the intro. And uh, I am a, a local Tampa Bay area uh, resident here. Uh, as my uh, bio indicated, I had worked for Raymond James for 20 years as a cell side research analyst. And a little bit of terminology for those of you that might not be as familiar. Um, the cell side analyst is the guy who you hear about on CNBC, who's you know raising the target price or upgrading and downgrading stocks. Um, that was the uh, my day job. My client uh, historically were institutional investors. So think of Fidelity and T Rowe and Putnam and hedge funds. Um, I did that uh, for the last ten to fifteen years at Raymond James. I focused exclusively on the satellite and space industry. And I'll give you a little depressing data point here. I was the only analyst on Wall Street that wrote on the space industry, um, which gives you an indication uh, there were defense analysts that would cover a Lockheed or a Northrop Grumman, and there might be a telecom analyst that would cover a company doing SATCOM equipment, uh, but there was nobody who was really focused on space as an industry. And I'll go into that a little bit in my discussion here. Uh, so. First of all, just to start with, I left Raymond James to start Quilty Analytics because I'm a believer in what is happening in the space industry. And you know, the bottom line is the industry is undergoing massive positive change. And it really cuts across every sector of the industry. So the launch industry, uh, satellites and satellite manufacturing technology, the ground equipment, software, analytics, uh, it, it really is, uh, touching every little corner of the industry. And a lot, fortunately, a lot of this stuff is happening with a focus on the commercial sector. And that's very different. I mean, this industry has forever been dependent upon government and government customers as their primary lead. And that's still true in most sectors, but you're seeing the shift towards commercial and that has positive implications um, for the industry's growth over the long term. Uh, what's causing all this change? Well, there, there's not a single factor really that you can point to. It cuts across technology, uh, regulations, geopolitics, structural finance. Uh, it, it's really every little corner again. And to give you an example on the, the technology front, some things that we focus on, um, obvious one like reusability with SpaceX's uh, Falcon 9 or air launch, uh, very high throughput satellites, electric propulsion, uh, satellite servicing, additive manufacturing, uh, and just the general application of Moore's law, which this industry historically was impervious to. Uh, on the geopolitics side, uh, you're seeing the United States, uh, I was gonna say Air Force, but let's go with Space Force, right? Uh, is changing the entire architecture of the U.S. military's uh, satellite infrastructure, going from big geos to a disaggregated uh, LEO constellations. Uh, that has huge implications for the supply chain and for the commercial sector upon whom uh, the SDA is relying to procure satellites. Uh, other things that fall in that geopolitics, you've got cyber security and jamming issues. Space debris is, is showing up as a major issue. Uh, when you look at some of the structural changes to the industry, uh, things that you might not focus on, like insurance rates, which have skyrocketed recently, uh, will have an impact on the industry. Uh, the development of commercial spaceports and the, the access to launch the formation of the Space Force, and uh, as he was heading out the door, uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine launched the Artemis Accords. All of this can have uh, large changes on how the industry interacts. And so finally, the, the area of my expertise that I just wanted to talk about was on finance. And I think it's also an area that most of the participants here today have an interest in. Um, the focus is gonna be on venture capital, but that's not the only thing that has happened in the industry. Uh, export credit agencies have turned up as a major source of capital for companies in the industry. Uh, private equity, which was long dormant, has come back uh, aggressively acquiring and rolling up companies. And you've got factors like uh, our billionaire investors, whether Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos and others. Uh, but really the one that, that we're going to talk about here is venture capital. Uh, and to start with, let me just say that venture capital did not exist in the space industry for most of its history, uh, with a little bit of, of a modification. But 
just to give you a sense of the investment climate from 2000 to 2004, albeit this was in the wake of when uh, the last great space bubble sort of burst, there were an average of four venture capital space investments globally for the entire industry for a year over a, a four-year time frame. And we'll, we'll talk about how that has ramped up demonstrably in the recent years. So why, why don't VCs like the industry or why didn't they like the space industry? Well, it was basically the antithesis of what VCs like. Um, capital, light, fast moving businesses that iterate with massive addressable markets. When you look at the traditional space industry, well, and even today, it's capital intensive, right? You've got to plow a lot of money into the business. There's very long investment cycles. Uh, I already mentioned you have heavy government involvement, both as a regulator and a competitor in many cases. Um, and it's got a cyclical history and uh, launch costs were always a, a, a basically a break on the industry's ability to grow. You, you just couldn't get things in orbit. Uh, and there were very limited investment opportunities, which I mentioned previously as, a, as an analyst at Raymond James, there were maybe a dozen public companies that I could write research on. So the uh, attractiveness to venture capital is kind of an interesting. If you go back and look at what happened in the 90s, uh, when there was another big space boom, uh, companies like Teledesic, Iridium, Global Star, um, Ellipso, Skybridge, What's interesting was the VCs weren't around back then. All of those companies were corporate funded. So uh, Motorola backed Iridium, uh, you had Teleglobe and Boeing and Alcatel and Orbital and Lockheed. Uh, those were the, the sources of capital in the last big round. And, and as I mentioned, the vast majority of the money that we're seeing invested today is coming from venture money. And so back to my statement earlier, you know, in the early 2000s, you had basically four VC back space investments a year. Well, from 2005 to 2009, it sort of kicked up a little bit around nine investments a year. Uh, from 2010 to 2014, 23. And in the last five years, I'm going to exclude 2020 for now, 122 on average uh, investors. And again, to give you a sense of things, in 2015, there were more first-time venture capital investors in the space industry than had cumulatively invested in the industry in the prior 20 years. Uh, so this is a new phenomenon. And what you're seeing is not only uh, venture firms that are doing multiple space investments, like Promise Ventures, uh, Bessemer Venture Partners, uh, IQT, IQT uh, IQTEL, uh, the CIAs, uh, venture fund uh, has been a multiple investor in the space industry, but we've also seen the development of space only venture capital firms, the two most prominent probably being uh, Seraphim Capital over in London and uh, Space Angels uh, out of New York, which have funds that are specifically focused on the space industry. There's a little wiggle room, Seraphim does some stuff in UAVs and whatnot, but uh, these guys are pretty well focused. And by the way, if you haven't found either of those firms, they're a good resource. They do publish either quarter, quarterly or annual reports that you can pull up that show the pace of uh, space investment. Uh, Quilty Analytics also publishes on a, on a monthly basis sort of a transactional summary of things that are happening in the industry. You can sign up for that for a complimentary email on our website. Uh, and we keep much more detailed information, uh, both on venture and private. So um, how has all of this new investors translated into new money? Um, well, it's been pretty interesting. So again, if you looked prior to 2015, over the prior five, 10 years, on average, there was about $100 million, to be specific, specific $112 million a year that was invested into space companies. Uh, to put that in perspective, in January of 2018, uh, WAG, which was a uh, soft, soft bank backed dog walking app, raised 300 million. So the entire space industry globally was raising about 112 million a year, not a popular investment. So that all changed in 2015 in a big way uh, the industry's funding, which, you know, again, around 112 million jumped to a billion eight. 
And that has climbed, not, not exactly steadily, but this year in 2020, it was about $5.7 billion. So again, put that in perspective, 5.7 billion versus 94 million in 2014. That's a big change. Um, now, one of the things I will note is that 112 million a year that was being invested, if you exclude the OneWebs and SpaceX, the very large check uh, transactions that have happened for the big broadband constellations, those two companies alone, OneWeb and SpaceX, have raised about $8.3 billion in the last six years. Um, if you exclude them, the industry on average is generating about $1.4 billion in investment uh, a year. Uh, and it has been accelerating. I think in, in 2020, we were actually looking at about $3.3 billion. So it's scaling up. Uh, where is that investment going, you may wonder? <laughs> so you can be in front of it. Well, uh, if we generally break the industry down into to three primary sectors, and I've got another category. Uh, but the biggest area of investment is what we call the enablement. Uh, enablement would be any of the things that you need uh, to support the actual satellite on orbit. So it's the launch and the satellite manufacturing side and some of the ground equipment uh, that goes into it. Uh, enablement, to give you a sense, was about 65 of the 157 deals that were done in 2020. So that's about 41% of all deals were in the enablement side. And it's also been one of the bigger ticket uh, in terms of dollar contribution because of the likes of uh, well, let's see, uh, relativity uh, raised 500 million late in the year. We had a, two different Chinese launch providers uh, that also raised between 150 to 200 million. Uh, you've got companies like Astroscale doing orbital debris removal that raised 51 million. And it's a good, pretty good cross-section of companies. Uh, so number one is enablement. The, the second largest area of investment is in what we call the uh, EO and geospatial Domain. So this is companies like ISI uh, raised 87 million for their uh, synthetic aperture radar constellation, uh, GHGSAT doing carbon, car, uh, excuse me, methane monitoring did about 30 million. And then on the small scale, companies like uh, Enview, which does geospatial analytics, raised 12 million. Uh, so the EO and geospatial, about 27% of all capital raised. And then the third segment, uh, after enablement and geospatial is the SATCOM. Uh, SATCOM is about 18% of the capital raised. Uh, some examples there are companies doing ground equipment like Chimeta and Isotropic uh, that both raised money this year. You've got uh, dozens of small SAT constellations out there. Uh, Mariota was one that raised, I think, about $20 million this year. And then, of course, you've got the really big ticket dollars going to the likes of uh, SpaceX and OneWeb. So uh, before I, I kind of wrap up on, on venture capital, I did want to kind of broaden just a little bit on what else is happening in the investor in the, the space investment sector. So I mentioned, of course, the, the venture capital side, but we've also had a lot of private equity activity. Um, and in the old days of the satellite industry, you had very white shoe private equity firms like Apollo and Apex and Primera that were primarily buying the Inmarsats and Intelsats of the world and leveraging them up. Um, nowadays, what we've seen, and this is really only in the last two years, you've got middle market private equity firms uh, like AE Industrial Partners, uh, which formed a business unit called Redwire. I think they've done seven acquisitions this year. Uh, Blackstone, through their Amerigen arm, uh, or acquired Amerigen along with a couple of other companies. Uh, and then I'll call it a bit of a hybrid, but uh, Voyager, which was uh, started in part by uh, Dylan Taylor, who is one of the uh, larger well-known angel investors, is also engaged in a bit of a roll-up strategy. Um, the other thing that's become very active in the space industry are these SPACs, or blank check companies. I uh, can't go into a dissertation of what a SPAC is other than it's a pile of money used to acquire companies. Uh, in the old days, most of those SPAC transactions uh, were, were used to take over existing operational companies. But what we've seen in the latest round of SPACs uh, that really perked up beginning last year 
is that uh, many of the companies that are being acquired are what I would call, well, hopefully late stage, but mid to late stage venture back companies that would normally be going to raise another venture round are now all of a sudden going public. Uh, we've had six in the space sector, uh, AST and Science, which is doing a direct to phone uh, satellite system, Astra on the launch side, uh, Black Sky, which has uh, Im imaging satellites, uh, Momentus, a space tug, Spire, which does uh, weather and ship tracking and aircraft tracking applications from a 3U CubeSat, uh, Rocket Lab, a small launch company, uh, and really the one that kicked off this back craze was Virgin Galactic back in 2019. And when I say craze, um, the SPACs have really taken over Wall Street. Uh, to put it in perspective, in the three years leading up to uh, 2020, uh, what we thought was going to be a COVID-impaired year and turned out to be nothing of the, of the sort, there were about 40 to 50 of these SPAC deals a year. And they would raise you know, anywhere from 12 to $14 billion. In 2020, there were 231 SPAC deals, not 40 to 50, uh, and the industry raised $78 billion. And actually through the first three months of this year, uh, we've already done, uh, I'm gonna look, 187 SPACs versus 231 in all of last year, and already raised about another $60 billion. Um, Again, I could do an entire discussion on SPACs and what the implications are for the industry, but one interesting side note is those SPACs actually trade as public companies on a listed exchange. So if you as a retail investor uh, get excited about SPAC, about the space industry, there's now a lot more opportunities, even before these deals are fully consummated, to go out and buy an ownership stake in AST and Science or Rocket Lab. You can own it today, um, or at least the proxy for it. So uh, the SPAC uh, phenomenon has done one good thing for the industry, which is uh, in, in talking and working with venture capitalists over the past 10 years, one of the big concerns about the space industry is that it is a roach motel. In other words, you can check in, but you can never get out. Uh, there were extremely limited number of exits for the industry. Um, of venture-backed companies. People would often talk about Skybox Imaging, which was bought by uh, Google for 500 million back in, geez, 2012, I can't remember, but very few IPOs. So suddenly these SPACs are providing an out for many of these investors uh, that have been nurturing their space investments for the long end of what is typically a 10-year investment cycle on the maximum side. So uh, that, uh, the, the continual uh, capital raising that we're seeing going on in the SPAC market has good, good indications for the overall space industry. And I expect we're gonna see several other uh, companies, venture-backed companies, announce a blank check transaction before the year's out. So uh, that's my overall presentation on what is happening in the industry. I do wanna, as someone who has worked with a number of venture-backed companies and with venture capitalists, and I'm an investor in, a, in an LP, several LP funds. Uh, just give you my two cents worth for everyone out there who's who's got a company that they've started and they're raising capital, uh, sort of my keys to success, and I'll give you five of them. Number one is you've got to tell an exciting and compelling story where inevitably you want space to be an enabler for the story, not the story itself. Um, not to say people can't be successful by telling a sexy space story, uh, but you've got to get sort of the end markets right. Uh, number two is, speaking of end markets, you have to have a credible, addressable market that investors can understand and see that there's a product fit that you're going after and that the company has a growth path. The third one, uh, and this is especially important in the space industry, is you have to demonstrate a path to de-risk your business model. And with space, these tend to be relatively, you know, definitive markers of things that you've accomplished. You've launched a satellite, you've tested it, uh, you've built ground stations, but lay out that path for investors so they understand what to watch for along the path. Uh, the fourth one is um, emphasize where those individual milestones create value for investors. And I've seen this, 
numerous times in the past, the difference between a company that has a good idea and even a good design versus somebody that has put hardware on orbit and has created heritage is a huge difference. And you want to think about if you're raising capital, if you can possibly wait and do it after you achieve that heritage, your valuation is going to be significantly higher. And so finally, and, and my last point here is you have to understand that not every venture investor uh, is a good fit. In fact, as I started off the whole presentation, venture investors historically were not particularly amenable to the space industry. And even today, if you take the five or 10,000 venture capital firms that exist, it's a small minority. I don't know the exact percent, I'd say 10, 15% that will invest in something hardware centric. And space has a lot of hardware related to it. Um, you can also try to target those investors that have made multiple investments in space. These guys are educated and can come up to speed quicker, but uh, unless it's somebody like a Seraphim or um, a Space Angels that are 100% focused, they're gonna have a, a natural top to how much space they actually want in their portfolio. So it's a lot of work, but uh, if you spend the time and do the research, uh, there are uh, a growing number of investors that are excited and interested about this space, and uh, I'm excited for the opportunity that all the companies presented, uh, and I wish everybody the best. And with that, I'll open it up, I guess, if there's any questions or we get to hear the, the judges' results. Let's try and get a couple questions in, Chris. Does anybody have any questions? I got a hand clap. I don't know how to do that. That was cool. <laughs> um, I can ask a quick question. Uh, so in general, there's a lot of technology that's really associated with um, building up to like colonization of space or some sort of moon base or something like that. Uh, where do you see the space and the investments in something like that or something correlated? Like um, I've talked to a lot of people in the sea setting industry and like that type of push. And uh, it seems like there's similar challenges for setting up something off of offshore as well as setting like a moon base on the moon. Yeah, so uh, what I would say generally is when we talk about the LEO economy, uh, either manufacturing in space, uh, space hotels or lunar, um, for a lot of investors, it's a bridge too far. Um, you know, I personally uh, am engaged with several companies that are involved in what I think are actually fairly credible uh, stories that are very well thought out around, uh, you know, either on orbit LEO or, or lunar business models. And really, I, my advice for all of them is the same. You know, if you're going to go out and talk to investors, your first job is to convince the investors you're not effing crazy, right? Because although all of us are experienced and we, we understand the industry and the technology, you often lose track of the point that the general public is not. And then even seasoned investors, I kind of run things by my kids. And if they look at me funny, I know I have a little bit more education to do. Um, and, uh, you know, that's usually a, a pretty good ask, a pretty good marker, you know, ask your friends and family, hey, did you have any idea that NASA's just paying companies fixed prices, fixed price contracts to take stuff to the moon? And 99 out of 100 people will have no idea about the CLIPS program. It's exciting stuff. Uh, and I think that does set up you know, uh, again, a government helping hand to both endorse and support commercial markets. But, uh, you know, I would say, generally speaking, those types of investments, um, and especially after the failure of things like Deep Space Industries and, ooh, I forget the other one that was doing asteroid mining, you know, they put a little bit of a black eye on the industry. Not that those are bad business models. I think they were just simply too early. And so I think for those types of investments, uh, you're probably not going to a traditional venture capitalist. You're probably going more uh, a friends and family or a family office that take very different types of bets with very different timeframes uh, as your most likely source of capital. Any other questions? I have one. Sure, go ahead. Uh, given that we're 
trying to open up the commercial marketplace for space to earth services, in our case, uh, remote sensing analytic services, we're trying to build a bridge to many different end user markets. And most of them are not familiar with space. They're jaded with what they know. They're also financially conservative. What kind of forum do you think is a good one to introduce space to earth commercial services along the lines we've been discussing today? For everybody, but for us, of course, we're interested. Yeah, well, you bring up a very valid point. And I, I mentioned it in my presentation that the industry is heavily dependent upon government. And I'll give you an example. In the earth observation market, which by and large, it's it's optical imagery today, but we have a dozen startups doing synthetic aperture radar. There's several doing hyperspectral. They're doing weather. They're doing IR. Uh, I have a spreadsheet with 300 companies doing downstream analytics. Uh, you know, so there's a wealth of activity happening here. But you know, put in scale, it's about a two and a half, three billion dollar industry, which in the scheme of things is not all that big. And I would argue that 80 or 85 percent of that revenue today is generated from government users. And just to give you a sense, uh, Maxar Technologies, uh, which is the parent company of both GOI and Digital Globe, the two original domestic satellite imagery companies, uh, in 2019, their entire commercial revenue out of you know north of a billion dollars in revenue was 122 million. That was their commercial business, selling imagery to Google Earth and. Microsoft and uh, you know auto manufacturers or, or whatever customer. And I would tell you, this is my personal opinion, just from observing these companies over time, um, a lot of the satellite operators have historically worked through a wholesale approach. They sell their imagery, they sell their SAR data to third parties, uh, either distributors of the data or uh, directly to end users of the data uh, in terms of resellers. Uh, and what I found is the satellite operators themselves often have a distant understanding of what the end market applications are. In other words, if you're talking oil and gas or insurance, they have very specific requirements around what they need, both the type of imagery, the spectral bands. And uh, I think that's where things have been missing uh, for much of the past decade or decades is the industry just doesn't have a very sound grounding in what the end markets are, agriculture being an example, and how to serve those customers. So I think we're moving there. There's great things happening with uh, AI and ML and the ability to take data and you know do very uh, specific uh, tailoring of the data sources and the outputs for customers, but it's still a work in progress. So, so you would agree that the idea of being a more customer specific, both in data and anal analytics and the medium would make sense. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, it works on both ends. I think the customer facing entity, um, you know, even if it's a geospatial analytics company like uh, Ursa, right, they have to know exactly what the customer needs in the energy market and they have to serve it well. But I'd also argue when you back it up to the satellite operators, you know, an imaging satellite is not a one size fits all. I, I, I personally think you could see a market for satellite constellations built specifically for the agriculture market. The requirements are so much different than what the US military needs or what the insurance industry needs. And so I think you're gonna see a diversity of assets on orbit and a lot higher skill sets and customer knowledge uh, on the ground I mean, that's what we need in the long term for the industry to grow that commercial side of the business. All right. And with that, thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciated your talk. And Max, I believe you're going to be coming back. You got me, Robin? <laughs> I'd like to, first of all, thank everybody who participated, uh, yeah, not just, uh, you know, uh, especially, you know, I, I mean, our, our judges, there's so many people who, who, who came and did a great job here. Our judges, our, our collaborators at Synapse and, uh, and Tampa Bay Wave, 
Um, all, all the innovators who came, uh, I know it's challenging to do videos and, and, and you're probably used to pitches and going into the virtual environment, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. And I really appreciate all the work that you guys did and all the judges, uh, the judging was very difficult. Uh, we had to make uh, a tough decision, but uh, we did finally uh, reach a decision and um, I will give you um, uh, just a little bit of, this is my personal thoughts uh, uh, to, to frame the, the, the decision. I, I've always been kind of embarrassed as an NASA employee when I think about space garbage. I, I thought that as, you know, landfilling the, 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 the world is, is, is something that I think is embarrassing for us as human beings. But I thought, hey, once we're engineers, we're NASA, we start, we go into space, we can be better than this, right? And then we go up into low Earth orbit, we got junk flying all around and it's embarrassing. And I personally uh, love the idea that 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 as we go uh, out uh, into um, the, the, uh, onto lunar or Martian applications, uh, or just living in space in general, that we are uh, forced by necessity to really make everything cyclical to deal with your waste stream in in a way that is uh, that that makes it so you don't have to launch as much, but also forces you to be uh, a better steward of your environment because your environment is very just scarce when you're in space. And for that reason, uh, we have decided to uh, go with full cycle bioplastics as the winner for Ignite the Night. And uh, so, Delayed, uh, do you have? Any uh, acceptance? <laughs> I accept. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, it's um, it's an incredible honor. It's very humbling to have even been able to participate. So thank you all so much. Um, obviously, we are here because the space biomanufacturing potential is really awesome. Um, but full cycle really exists to address the climate crisis from multiple angles. We know that. Um, if we can get off Earth, for some of us, that seems like a good solution. But while we're stuck here, we really need to deal with the carbon and methane in the atmosphere and come up with more viable solutions. And, you know, personally, I'm a big believer that full cycle and PHA, the way we do it, is that solution. So thank you all so much for the opportunity. Um, for anyone who's interested in seeing if your feedstock is viable in our process, if you're interested in licen licensing our technology, my email is delane at fullcyclebioplastics.com and I would love to talk to you. Thank you all, really appreciate it. Uh, Peter Hughes, I'd like to invite you up to say some words uh, about the winner as well. Yes, uh, I just want to say to all the um, technologists, all the companies, a big congrats for great, great technologies. I've been involved with uh, iTech for about five or six uh, times. And I'll tell you, it's a very, very difficult decision that we are pressed hard to make a tough decision. It's also, also very challenging because we're doing this virtually too. Um, if we were in person, I'd be around high-fiving you guys and making contacts and, make, and connecting you to other people in the agency. But Every one of you are working on very vital technologies for our future as mankind explores the uh, near Earth, uh, that you know, that, that deeper spaces. Um, I congratulate each one of you for your technologies, your your ambition, your hard work for this, because every one of these has a, a place in our space exploration. So thank you for your time. We look forward to more great engagements with you and seeing you guys all contribute to mankind's quest to to explore the uh, the universe and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Once again, really appreciate everybody, um, all the innovators, all the participants. Uh, can't do it without you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity.